Are we living in the world of the end? If so, what does the Bible tell us about this time? These days of war, devastation, unrest, strife, deception, and lawlessness. Jesus has given us a prophecy to prepare us for what's to come. Prophecies that should shape our priorities, define our character, and help us thrive instead of just survive in these days of uncertainty. He didn't give us this information so that we would be afraid of what's to come or be overwhelmed by the world of the end. But Jesus gave us this message so we can face it with confidence and hope. Though the circumstances around us may seem dire and our future dim, they should make us stronger and better equipped to be a light in the world around us. The world of the end. We're all familiar with the term, the end of the world, but are we living in the world of the end? We're certainly living during troubling times. Some days it seems like bad news is everywhere you turn. And with such a landslide of troubling news comes the questions. Why is this happening? When will it stop? And what can we do? Well, Dr. David Jeremiah has been studying and teaching from God's Word for more than 60 years. Amazing. And in his teaching series entitled, The World of the End, he focuses on a portion of biblical prophecy that is unique from all others because they are the words of Jesus himself. Dr. Jeremiah believes that Jesus doesn't give us this very special prophecy so that we would be afraid or overwhelmed by the world of the end, but to face it with confidence and with hope. Dr. Jeremiah is here to challenge us not to be frightened, I love this, but to be faithful. And I'm excited that he's here to share this very important study with us. Won't you help me welcome Dr. David Jeremiah. I am so excited to be here in this beautiful church and to be with you again. And one of the things that we all know is that one of the trademarks of your ministry is that you make God's Word so understandable. You know, even complicated passages, you teach them and we understand. And you are an authority on biblical prophecy, but you don't just teach biblical prophecy, you teach the entire Word of God. But for this series, you've gone back to biblical prophecy. So I wanted to ask, why now and why this? There's this portion of scripture in Matthew 24 that often gets neglected. In fact, many Bible teachers say it's the most neglected prophetic a portion of God's Word, and it's so strange because these are the words of Jesus. And I began to read those words and became overwhelmingly just blessed by the way Jesus used uh, some of his last words before he went to the cross to prepare his disciples and us for what's coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Of all the people that you want to listen to about what's going to happen in the future, you can choose a lot of experts, but you can't choose anybody better than Jesus. No. And one of the reasons for that, Sheila, is that he's timeless. Mm -hmm. He's God in the flesh, and he's now God in heaven with, with the Father, but he lives in the present. Our future is still his present, and when he talks about the future, he's already there. <laughs> And he knows what's going to happen because he's already experienced it. And you can have this confidence in what he says because you know it's the absolute truth. Yeah. So instead of running around trying to figure out what did he say, what did she say, what's in this book, what's in that book, maybe it's a good idea for us to just take a few moments and listen to the master. Amen. <laughs> Is there a difference between the end of the world and the world of the end? Yes. You know, if I told you I was going to talk about the end of the world, you probably wouldn't come um, <laughs> because I don't know when the end of the world is. And the Bible tells us we don't even have the right to speculate that. But I do know that we are in the world of the end. We are not at the end of the world, but we're in the world of the end. In one of the passages, Jesus says, but the end is not yet. Yeah. 
And in another passage, he calls what we're going to talk about the beginning of sorrows. Mm -hmm. So while the end of the world is not tomorrow, at least I don't think so, we are in the world of the end. We're in the season. We may not know the day, we may not know the hour, but we can know the season. And we're in the season of prophecy. Anybody who studies the Word of God seriously would have to admit that. Now, I know people say they don't believe it, but how many of you know because you don't believe it doesn't make it untrue. (laughs) So true. And uh, the Bible is very clear about the things we're going to talk about. These are not my words, not Sheila's words. We didn't find this in some book of wisdom. This is Jesus on the Olivet Discourse. There's a phrase that you use in the teaching that I found I'd never heard before, but I thought, yeah, you say prophecy is practical. What do you mean by that? Well, if you study prophecy, I promise you, you you can't avoid it because every place there's a prophetic truth, in the context of that prophetic truth, there is a practical admonition or a practical truth. Jesus never meant for prophecy to be pie in the sky by and by. He meant it to help us understand the future so we would know how to live today. That's why in this book, at the end of every chapter, there is how do we live today because this is true. We don't need to be just, you know, it's not going to do us any good if we're just smarter about the future. Mm. The future sets the stage for how we live today. And I believe that that's very true across the whole length and breadth of prophecy in the Bible. You touched on that, but it's one of the things I love most about this teaching, that at the end of every message, you have listed out every scripture, all the scriptures that relate to that. That is a phenomenal tool. The Bible is what helps us through the tough times. But if you don't know where the verses are that deal with the problem you're facing, it's pretty tough. You can't be a generalist. You've got to be a specialist. So we've tried to find the 10 best verses for every chapter in this book. We put them at the end of the chapter in the printed book. I grew up in a Christian home, and my mom and dad used to have a little box on the kitchen table. It was called the promise box, and it had all these verses in it. And every night after dinner, all the kids around the table would take one of those promises out, and we would read the promises around the table and put them in the back of the box so they circulated back. And that was something I grew up with. And we're creating a little promise box that goes with this series to give you the verses that really speak to the issues that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, and you say a little promise box. This is going to be phenomenal. Everyone is going to want one of these. The subtitle of the book is How Jesus' Prophecy Shapes Our priorities. And the first uh, message is titled A Prophecy. And I have to tell you, this message gave me chill bumps because you take us right to the moment when Jesus delivered these words. Mm. It's the last week of his life. We've had Palm Sunday, Monday, he's turned over the tables in the temple. Now it's Tuesday evening, and he's speaking to his closest friends. Why is this prophecy so important? Well, Jesus gave this prophecy uh, on the Mount of Olives, Mm. Unlike what many people think, he didn't give it to all of his disciples, just four, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And he did it in response to the questions they asked. If you've ever been to Israel and you've been on the Mount of Olives, you know you can see the whole Temple Mount from there. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, the Bible says, he sat on that mountain in the position of authority, and he talked to these four disciples about what was to come, somewhat immediately and then ultimately. Yeah. Amazing. Some people say, well, I think some of this has already happened. But you're teaching this because you say this prophecy is so relevant for how we're living today. Otherwise, you would not be teaching on it. Right. Part of the prophecy that Jesus gave that, that particular day on the Mount of Olives was, from the standpoint of humanity, it's the most absurd thing you've ever heard in your life. Jesus pointed to the temple and said, in a short time, not one stone will be left upon another on this temple. And I've done a whole bunch of research on the temple, and I've tried to imagine what that must have sounded like to those four disciples. I mean, hear yourself saying, right, sure. (laughs) That isn't going to happen, but it did happen, and we know it happened because we have the record of it in 70 AD from Josephus and the other secular writers. Jesus told the truth about that. Somebody said, why did he do that? And I I wrote in my book, he filed his prophetic credentials because he said, this is going to happen. It happened just a few years later in 70 AD. 
So we have the record of his prophecy and we have the record of the fulfillment and we know both of those are true. And Jesus said, this happened and just like this happened, everything else I'm gonna tell you is gonna happen as well. You can trust the prophecies of Jesus. He gave us this incredible example in those first few verses. As you studied this passage in Matthew 24, was there anything in particular that stood out to you? You know, Sheila, early on in this study, I found myself remembering how easy it is for us during times like this to ask the Lord to change our circumstances. Have you done that? Lord, can you just please change this? And sometimes I think we should hear the Lord saying back to us, you want me to change the circumstances so your life will be better, but I'm going to use the circumstances to make you better. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe the question is not, what can I do to change the circumstances, but how can I let these circumstances change me so that I become a better person? Moving on to the second message, which is in a world of deception, be honest. After the first message, it it felt like there's a whole shift Mm -hmm. in the teaching, and it's to us as to how to live in these days. How are you challenging us to live? I think you would say it this way, in a world of deception, what can you do? Just be honest. I mean, that seems so simple. Mm -hmm. And yet, this honesty is rampant among Christian people. It's rampant in churches. And Jesus said, see that you be not deceived. Mm -hmm. When you walk into the prophetic world, you walk into a world where if you're not careful, you can be deceived. You need to keep your head on straight and listen carefully and study carefully because Satan wants to use that environment to confuse you and and deceive you. And Jesus says, beware, don't be deceived. I can't think of a time in my lifetime when there's been so much confusion and deception. And I think many of us wonder, like, who on earth can you trust? How do we as God's children, as Christ's disciples, live in a time like this? I mean, sometimes we just want to hide till it's all over. Yes. First of all, we know the great deceiver is Satan. And the Bible says he's the father of lies. There is no truth in him. There never has been. All deceit originates with Satan. And uh, it began, as we know from history in the, in the garden, when Satan uh, deceived Adam and Eve. Did you know that he had a strategy then that he's never changed? He used the exact same strategy when he tried to deceive Jesus uh, in the wilderness. He uses that same strategy on you and me every day. And in the end of this chapter, I went back into the third chapter of Genesis and I laid out Satan's strategy. Here's how he does his work. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of the devices of Satan. That means study a strategy so you don't get sucked in. Don't let Satan take you out of your walk with the Lord simply because you've never spent any time figuring out what his plan is. The Bible says he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I remember one day when it became apparent to me that he doesn't want to devour you personally. He wants to devour your influence. He wants to ruin you and your influence for Jesus Christ. Don't let him do it. Well, how do I keep him from doing it? His whole arsenal of ideas is in the third chapter of Genesis. Study it so you don't get caught up in it. And we kind of laid that out at the end of that chapter. The next message is titled, In a World of War, Be Calm. I mean, I cannot think of a more perfect message for the times that we are living in. When you hear on the news wars, rumors of wars, what comes to your mind? When Jesus says that in the end times, you should be aware of the fact that just as a woman is going through pregnancy, her pain will be more frequent and more intense as she gets close to the time of birth the issues of war will become more intense and more frequent as we come close to the time of the Lord's return. He actually uses that a couple of times in the New Testament. Mm. He says, you're gonna hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled. He meant that because first of all, war doesn't take him by surprise. And he has everything in control. Mm -hmm. And he is the one who can bring peace to our hearts even when there's turmoil all around us. I love John 16 where Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. The next message is, in a world of disasters, be confident. What do you think Jesus was talking about there when he talked about a world of disasters? He actually tells us there are gonna be diseases, Mm -hmm. 
there's going to be famine and there are going to be earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is, as we move toward the time when Jesus is to return, you're going to see more and more of that. We just came through a pandemic. It's the first universal pandemic any of us have ever known. We have not known anything like that before. What we learned there was that disease can infect a world, not just a nation. It infected the whole world. Every nation in the world had this COVID-19 stuff. Jesus said, as you get closer to the time when I'm going to return, you're going to see more pestilence. That's disease. All Jesus is saying is, here's some things to watch for. These are not so much signs as they are indications that we are living in the world of the end. It's not the end of the world, but we're, we're living in the world of the end. We're in the season of our Lord's return, and that's a very important principle for us to understand. Message five is, in a world of persecution, be prepared. Mm -hmm. And honestly, interestingly enough, I find that one of the most encouraging messages that you have written. A lot of us tend to think, well, yeah, in the first century, believers were persecuted. We know what Nero did, all those people. That's really not such a problem anymore. What would you say to that? Sheila, when I was growing up, when I got 16, I guess my parents must have thought I was capable of handling it. They gave me a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs, oh, wow. and they wanted me to read it and it scared the living daylights out of me because it's the story of the suffering that Christians had gone through during that period of time for their faith. Uh, I won't even attempt to give you the descriptions because they're horrible. And I think probably growing up and even until middle adulthood, I just assumed that that was stuff that happened in the past. In the past, people used to be persecuted for their faith. Mm. But did you know that more persecution has happened in the last 70 years than have happened in all of history. And that today persecution touches every country. It is overwhelmingly serious in many countries of the world where the gospel is being pushed back. And it's starting to reach its ugly, icy fingers into the American culture. It's going to cost us more and more to be Christians. Our faith is going to be more challenged than it's ever been before. And Jesus said that. He said, you will be persecuted, you will be marginalized, you will be hated. And then we read in the Bible, Jesus said, if they hated me, don't be surprised if they hate you because you're my follower. Persecution is only suffering that you incur because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And most of us have never experienced that. Yeah. But given what I understand is going on in the world today, some of us will experience that before we go to heaven. This is why I found that message so compelling, because you know, I travel all around the world, and the ministry of Turning Point goes all around the world, whether I've been in South Africa, Europe, Australia. There are people who will watch this interview who even now are being persecuted, mm -hmm. and they will sit and they will listen to you. What would you say to them? I would just say that God is enough, <laughs> and that God is with you. Uh, he has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. And I think there must be some kind of special connection with the Lord yeah. when you go through persecution. The disciples talked about being, being honored to be able to suffer for the Lord. Something happens to a person when they stand up for their faith and they're ridiculed or persecuted mm -hmm. by others. So the Bible says that during those times, Christ draws near to you as never before. And every story you read about someone who's gone through a time of persecution for their faith, that's the consistent answer. I never felt the presence of the Lord like I did during those days. If you want to know the presence of the Lord, get persecuted because that's when it happens. In the next message, you talk about in a world of betrayal, be faithful. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything more personally hard to cope with than when you're betrayed, particularly by someone you love or someone you know mm -hmm. or a fellow believer. Betrayal is interesting because it can't happen unless it's someone you know and someone you love and someone you've trusted. You can't be betrayed by somebody you don't know. So betrayal means you've allowed somebody into your life, somebody into your world. You've trusted them with who you are, and they have violated that trust and nothing ever hurts like that. It's what happens when someone's unfaithful to their spouse. It's what happens in school when somebody you thought was your friend 
um, betrays you on the internet. Mm -hmm. It happens over and over again in our culture. And Jesus said, as we get closer to the time when he returns, betrayal is going to be more prominent than it's ever been. People don't necessarily treasure their relationships as they once did. If it's not convenient for them, or if it's better for them, they'll throw you under the bus in a minute. I hate to say that, but it's true, and we know it's true, and we see it more and more all the time. So what do you do when a fellow believer, for a friend, a trusted friend, as you say, someone you've let into your life, betrays you? How do you deal with that? That's got to have happened to you. Well, it happened. it's happened to me two or three times in, in ways that, I mean, even just thinking about it, it makes me feel funny. Yeah. To be honest with you, if we're normal, we probably plan our revenge. <laughs> We make up our speeches. You get in your car and you have a little speech you're gonna give. If you ever see that person, they're gonna get a piece of your mind that you can't afford to lose. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's not the right way because if you allow that to happen, the cycle will just keep repeating itself. It's during times like that that you have to, you have to learn how to forgive. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult when somebody betrays you. But you have to refuse to take that offense upon yourself because if you don't, you'll be the one who is hurt. Mm -hmm. All of us have our own stories, and you know, the Bible says you heap coals of fire upon their head. And what that means is you do good to them, you pray for them, you bless them. It's not just in one verse, it's like in six verses in the New Testament. When somebody treats you badly, what do you do? You treat them better. You treat them the way you would want to be treated. Well, they don't deserve that, absolutely don't. Heap coals of fire on their head. The Bible says that's how you deal with this. But if you take the betrayal to your heart and you allow the betrayal to, to be your definition of who you are, it will destroy you. Yeah. And I pray that if you're in a situation where that has happened to you, you don't allow that betrayal to become who you are because you are not that. You are God's child and you need to take control of the situation. In your seventh message, it's titled, In a World of Lawlessness, Be Kind. Have you ever seen such a lawless time in our country? We do live in a world where law has been put aside and people do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Where there's no law, there's no love. And in that world in which we are now living, that should say something to us about, are we at the world of the end? Mm -hmm. Have you, like you said, I've never seen this before. What does that mean? It's greater than it used to be. Yeah. It's more intense than it used to be. It's more frequent than it used to be. That tells us something. Jesus is saying when those things begin to happen, Lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. Amen. In that kind of lawless world, be kind. You know, it's what we teach our children. Why do you think we're struggling as adults to be kind? Well, the, the human nature is if somebody is unkind to you, you be unkind to them. For a Christian, the Bible flips the script. Yeah. The Bible says if you have been treated in an unkind way, what does it say? Bless those who mistreat you. Bless mm -hmm. those who persecute you. You say, well, that's not natural. It absolutely is not. It's supernatural. And that's what makes it such a Christian thing. Yeah. You can do what other people can't do. And I've seen it over and over again where people who have been hurt take the hurt and turn it back on the person in a gift of kindness or blessing or prayer. And God uses that to to do miraculous things. What would you say to people who say, well, I think kindness is, is more like weakness? No, you know, I actually do pray on occasion, Lord, don't let me become a grumpy old man. Don't let me become a, <laughs> don't let me become a mean old, have you ever been around mean old people? Oh gosh, I mean, yes. mean old people are really mean. <laughs> uh, it looks like they've been practicing their whole life and now they've come to some sort of specialty. <laughs> kindness is the outcome of being gracious asking God every day to help you be gracious. Yeah. Your next message is, in a world of bad news, be the good news. I love the emphasis on not just sharing the good news, but being the good right. news. Well, you know, the end of the prophecy that Jesus gave said that in the end of the world, the gospel will be preached to the end of the ages. The whole world will hear the gospel. We're trying to do our very best even before that time to get the gospel. I just found out this week that Turning Point is now in 14 different languages. Wow. We're trying to get the gospel wow. all over the world, but we won't completely fulfill that. God is in control, 
there's a whole section about living in a determined way, mm -hmm. not being discouraged. Jesus told everybody that if you don't give up, if you don't give in, you will be saved. And he doesn't mean saved in salvation, but you will come to the end and you will endure. Yeah. And you know, how many of you know endurance is a big deal right now? You, you can't just do what you feel like doing. That's the thing I've been learning more and more. It used to be, you know, it was nice and sunny. And there weren't a lot of problems. You feel like getting up and go. Today, you've got to tell your body, get in gear and go do what you're supposed to do. I know you don't feel like it, but do it anyway. You've got to talk to yourself. Yeah. Because it's hard. We've talked about this before. This world is harder to live in than it's ever been since we've been here. What that means is we got to be tougher than we've ever been. We have to have more endurance. We have to have determination. I'm not going to let these things overwhelm me. I'm going to do the next thing that God wants me to do with all my heart. And when you do that, you find a kind of joy and excitement and faithfulness and endurance is a high, high quality yeah. to develop. And you know how you learn that? By going through tough things like we were going through. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that whole principle that we aren't always pray the circumstances will be better so our life will be easier, but we should pray that God would use the circumstances to make us better so that we can be more effective uh, for him, so that we can do our work with greater intensity and determination. If God doesn't intervene, we're going to experience some things we've never experienced. I am praying for the intervention and preparing for whatever God allows to happen because He's up to something for me and for you and for all of you who are watching. The Bible says, don't be surprised when these things happen to you. The thing I love about Jesus is he wants us to know the truth. He wants us to know the future. He goes out of his way on the Tuesday before he dies to give us the longest speech he ever gave about what's going to happen in the future. He says, please hear me. The Olivet Discourse is his message of love to us. Wow. Would you help me thank Dr. David Jeremiah? Thank you for joining me today on Turning Point. The more we study God's Word, the more we understand that our loving God desires to have a personal relationship with each one of us. If you would like to begin that relationship with Him, the first step is to repent of your sin and to ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. Once you make that decision to accept God's free gift of salvation, your journey with God as a new creation in Christ will begin. So if you have taken this step of faith today, I encourage you to share your decision with other Christians at a trustworthy ministry or a local church and to continue your growth in your newfound faith. May God bless you as you begin your walk with God. And I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Turning Point.